order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Mrs. Cheryl Gillan. Number one, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. This week marks the six month anniversary of the Grenfell Tower fire. I will be attending the National Memorial Service tomorrow, and I am sure I speak for members across the House when I say it remains at the forefront of our minds as a truly unimaginable tragedy that should never have happened. Many who survived the fire lost everything that night, and I can assure the House that we continue to do everything we can to support those affected and take the necessary steps to make sure it can never happen again. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mrs Cheryl Gillan. Mr Speaker, I think the Prime Minister will be able to take to that memorial service the thoughts and the prayers of every single member in this House across all parties. My right honourable friend has said that at the end of the Brexit process, members of Parliament will have an opportunity to vote on the deal. Can she confirm that it is still her intention to hold such a vote? I'm very happy to confirm to my right honourable friend that we will put the final withdrawal agreement between the UK and the EU to a vote in both Houses of Parliament before it comes into force. As we have said, we expect the UK Parliament to vote ahead of the European Parliament, so we fully expect Parliament to vote well before March 2019. So, to be clear, the final deal will be agreed before we leave, and Right Honourable and Honourable Members will get a vote on it. And as my Right Honourable friend, the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union, has set out today, we will then bring forward a Withdrawal Agreement and Implementation Bill to give the Withdrawal Agreement domestic legal effect, which will be subject itself to full parliamentary scrutiny. And, of course, after we leave, the Withdrawal Agreement will be followed up by one or more agreements covering different aspects of the future relationship and will introduce further legislation where it is needed to implement this into UK law, providing yet another opportunity for proper parliamentary scrutiny. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This week does indeed mark six months since the avoidable and tragic fire at Grenfell Tower which took the lives of 71 people and injured and traumatised many more, and I too will be at the service tomorrow in memory of them. But that fire also shone a light on the neglect of working class communities all over this country. And since this government came to power, homelessness is up by 50%. Rough sleeping has doubled. Homelessness and rough sleeping have risen every single year since 2010. Will the Prime Minister pledge today that 2018 will be the year when homelessness starts to go down? Across this House, we don't want to see anybody who is homeless or anybody who is sleeping rough on our streets. That is why the Government is putting £500 million into uh, the question of homelessness. It is why we backed the bill that was brought forward by uh, my honourable friend, the Member for Brent, uh, uh, sorry, for Harrow. Uh, and it is why we have ensured that we are putting into place a number of projects that will deal with this issue of rough sleeping. But I have to say to the Right Honourable Gentleman that when we look at the question of housing, we need to look at ensuring that there are more homes available to people, that we are giving people support to get into those homes. That is why, in the Budget, my Right Honourable Friend, the the, uh, Chancellor, set out a whole range of ways in which we will be helping people to ensure that they have their own roof over their heads, compared to Labour, where house building went down by 45 per cent where the number of homes bought and sold went down by 40 per cent, and social housing went down by 400,000. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, the last Labour government cut homelessness by two-thirds during its time in office. When Labour left office, the number of children in temporary accommodation was a lot less than it is now. I asked the Prime Minister for a pledge to reduce the amount of homelessness next year. The pledge was not forthcoming. 128,000 children will spend Christmas without a home to call their own, 60 per cent up on 2010. It's too late for this Christmas. 
But will the Prime Minister promise that by Christmas 2018, fewer children will be without a home to call their own? Say to the Right Honourable Gentleman again that we of course want every child to wake up in their own home, particularly at Christmas. But it is incredibly important. People know they can keep a roof over their heads, even in the most desperate circumstances. That's why we're making sure that councils can place families in a broader range of homes if they fall into these circumstances. So since 2011, councils have been able to place families into private rented accommodation so they can get a suitable place sooner. We've changed the law in relation to uh, uh, so that families with children shouldn't find themselves in B&B accommodation except in an emergency. And through implementing the Homelessness Reduction Act, we're making sure our families at risk can get support before they find themselves homeless. And I say to the, the uh, honourable gentleman, I have been very clear, as I was uh, uh, a few weeks ago, that this government is going to be a government that puts a clear focus on housing, yeah. on building the homes that people need, on ensuring, yeah. on ensuring that people are given help yeah. to get into those homes, and also on acting to prevent homelessness before it happens. That's what we're doing. That's what will make a real difference to people's lives. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, the sad reality is that one in a hundred children in this country are homeless at any one time. It is a national disgrace and it is getting worse. And for all she says about the private rented sector, can I just quote from a letter I received from Rachel this week? She says, I have a knot in my stomach every New Year period when we're due to sign a new tenancy agreement. After renting the same flat for 10 years, never being in arrears, and keeping the property in good order, we were given notice to quit out of the blue. Will the Prime Minister help people like Rachel and back secure three-year tenancies for all private renters? Say to the right honourable gentleman that if I think he was present in the chamber when the uh, budget was uh, given to this uh, chamber, and that's why, precisely why, we said that we are looking at ways in which we can encourage longer-term tenancies. Now, the point is, what is uh, what is important? What is important? is ensuring that people have the ability to have the accommodation that they need, that they want, and on the basis that, they, that is right for them. That is why, as I say, we are dealing with this issue of longer-term tenancies. But he talks about renting, people renting uh, their homes, and his response on renting is to bring in rent controls. Yeah. Now, rent controls have never worked. They result in reducing the number of homes that are available for people who want to be able to have accommodation and a roof over their own head. And it's not just me that says that Labour Party policy won't help people who are renting. Shelter say that it won't help people who are renting. Mr Speaker, evictions by private landlords have quadrupled since 2010. There is not security in the private rented sector, and the Prime Minister well knows it. She also promised one-for-one -one replacement of council housing sold off through right to buy. But just one in five council homes have been replaced. Hundreds of thousands of people are on housing waiting lists. Will the Prime Minister apologise for what she said and tell the House when she will deliver this one-for-one -one replacement? And as the Right Honourable Gentleman knows, we are uh, increasing the flexibilities to enable councils to actually build homes. We have put more money into affordable housing. He talks about the right to buy. I have to say, uh, what a contrast. We actually want to give people the opportunity to buy their own home. The Labour Party would take that opportunity away from them. What do we see? What do we see on housing? You know, the Shadow Housing Minister, the Shadow Housing Minister recently said that fewer people owning their own home is not such a bad thing. Well, I have to say to the right honourable gentleman that what he's offering to people on housing, if you live in a council home, he'll take away your right to buy. If you're looking to rent, shelter say his policies will harm you. And his shadow housing minister doesn't want to support people owning their own homes. It's only the Conservatives that will deliver the homes this country needs. 
if only it were true, Mr. Speaker. Under the Tories, home ownership has fallen by 200,000. Under Labour, it rose by 1 million. And 40% of all homes sold through Right to Buy are now in the private rented sector. The latest figures, Mr Speaker, show that a quarter of all privately rented homes are not up to decent standards, meaning many families are living in homes with damp that are not secure or very poorly insulated. Does the Prime Minister support homes being fit for human habitation? we want homes to be fit for human habitation, but can I just remind the Right Honourable Gentleman that the number of homes failing to meet the decent home standard is down by 49% since since the peak under the Labour government. Talking, while I'm talking about the record of the Labour government, statutory homelessness, statutory homelessness peaked under the Labour government and is down by over 50% since then. It's this government that is delivering for people on housing. It's this government that fa- Labour failed to deliver over 13 years. I would just remind the Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, that under Labour, a million homes are brought up to decent home standard. I would also assume from what she said she will be here on the 19th of January to support my honourable friend, the member for Westminster North's bill to make privately rented homes fit for human habitation. When it comes to housing, Mr Speaker, this government has been an absolute disgrace. After seven years, more people are living on the streets, more families in temporary accommodation, more families in homes not fit for human habitation, and fewer people owning their own home. When is this government going to get out of the pockets of property speculators and rogue landlords and get on the side of tenants and people without a home of their own this Christmas? Minister. Under Labour, house building down, homes bought and sold down, social housing down. One thing, I'll tell him one thing did go up under the last Labour government, the number of people on the social housing waiting list. 1.74 million people waiting for a home under a Labour government. We've delivered over 346,000 new affordable homes since 2010. More affordable homes have been delivered in the last seven years than in the previous seven years under a Labour government. We're building more homes. Uh, Last year we saw 217,000 more homes being built in this country. That's a record, apart from one year, that's a record for the last 30 years. It's the Conservatives that are doing what is necessary. Labour would produce failure for this country once again. It's the Conservatives that are delivering the homes that people need, the economy that people need, and the standard of living that people need. Isabel Wheel is a 14-year-old constituent of mine who lost both her arms and legs at the age of six when she was a victim of meningitis. I was one of many many MPs campaigning for the meningitis vaccine to be introduced into the NHS. Isabel is now on her way to becoming one of the UK's most accomplished gymnasts, junior gymnasts, one of the most talented trampolinists in the country. She was recently handed the Pride of Sports Award as a young achiever. Would the Prime Minister join me in congratulating Isabel on receiving this prestigious national award? I'm very happy to join my honourable friend in congratulating Isabel on receiving this award and congratulating her on her sporting achievements, but also on her incredible bravery. And I think she's an inspiration to all of us. And my honourable friend has mentioned about the uh, uh, meningitis vaccine and uh, that she was one of those who was campaigning on this issue. Of course, we know meningitis can be a devastating disease. That's why we have taken steps to increase the availability of the vaccine. 
and in September 2015, we became the first country to have a national meningitis B vaccination programme. And my honourable friend, as she says, contributed to the work on that. And, but it's necessary, of course, that Public Health England continues to raise awareness of the symptoms, and its campaigns are reaching hundreds of thousands of parents. And the NHS has been running a programme to vaccinate teenagers, school leavers and university freshers against four different strains of meningitis. I think my honourable friend can be pleased with the uh, impact that she had in the work that she did in relation to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ian Blackford. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In 2008, we collectively bailed out the Royal Bank of Scotland at a cost of £45 billion. In 2017, the Royal Bank of Scotland are paying us back by turning their backs in 259 of our communities. Given we are the majority shareholder, will the Prime Minister step in and tell the Royal Bank of Scotland to stick to their commitment and not close the last bank in town? I say, as I think the uh, right honourable gentleman knows, the decision to open and close branches is a commercial decision taken by the banks without intervention from the government. But we do recognise the impact this has on communities. And uh, the Secretary of State for Scotland raised concerns of the, uh, that the House have expressed on this issue in his meeting with RBS. Of course, more people are banking online. This is having an impact, but we do want to ensure that all customers, especially vulnerable ones, can still access over-the-counter services. And that's why we've established the Access to Banking Standard, which commits banks to carry out a number of steps before closing a branch. Uh, and the post office have also reached an agreement with the banks that will allow more customers than ever before to use post office services. So we recognise the importance of this on communities and have acted in a number of ways. Blackford. If the Prime Minister recognises the importance of this, she should be summoning Ross McEwen in to see it and making it clear that we will not accept towns and villages up and down the United Kingdom losing banking services. There are 13 towns in Scotland where the last bank will be going. This is not acceptable. It is about time the Prime Minister accepted her responsibilities. Will she summon Ross McEwen and will she tell the Royal Bank of Scotland this must be reversed? The decisions on opening and closing branches is a commercial matter for the banks. As I say, this is an issue that the Secretary of State has raised with Royal Bank of Scotland. But what is important, what is important is that services are available to individuals. That's why those are being provided and alternatives are available. But I also say to the right honourable gentleman that actually an awful lot more people are banking online these days, not requiring the use of a branch. We want to ensure that vulnerable customers particularly, who don't have access to online banking, are able to have services provided. That's precisely what we're doing through the Access to Banking Standard and the work with the Post Office. Julian Knight. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In 2015, the Heart of England Hospital Trust, which serves Solely Hull, got itself into major trouble due to poor management. In response, the management of University Hospitals Birmingham under Dane Julie Moore was brought in to take charge. As a result, finances, patient care and staff morale have improved considerably. Would the Prime Minister join me in praising my brilliant local NHS staff for this turnaround and agree that we must encourage and support good management in the NHS? Well, can I, can I say to my honourable friend that I am very happy to join him in paying tribute to the work that has been undertaken by University Hospitals uh, Birmingham in support of Heart of England Foundation Trust. We do want to see strong management across the National Health Service. Uh, I understand there are a number of practical and financial issues still to resolve in this, uh, in this issue, and I would encourage all of those who are involved to make progress on this important matter, but I congratulate those NHS staff who have seen that improvement and have worked hard to ensure that improvement takes place. I kill. Okay. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that the resignation of Lord Kerslake really does put the Government yeah. on a final warning of the NHS problem? And will she agree that in my constituency of Hartlepool, despite us having a perfectly good hospital, the people have, it's, it's disgraceful that people have to travel yeah, at least yeah. 15 miles to get to the nearest A&E? Yeah. Yeah. I say to the honourable gentleman that I think Lord Kerslake made the right decision in stepping uh, down as chairman of King's College Hospital. Uh, I'm not surprised that the Labour Party are interested in this, and given, of course, that the noble Lord Lord Kerslake is a key adviser to the uh, Labour Party. 
Uh, but if I can say to the honourable gentleman, he might care to look at what NHS improvement said about King's uh, College oh. Hospital. The financial situation at King's has deteriorated very seriously over recent months, and we have now placed the Trust in special measures to maximise the amount of scrutiny and support that it receives. It is not acceptable for individual organisations to run up such significant deficits when the majority of the sector is working extremely hard to hit their financial plans and, in many cases, have made real progress. They called the situation the worst in the NHS. Perhaps it is no surprise that the noble Lord, Lord Kerslake, I understand, is advising the Labour Party on matters of debt and deficit. At the end of their first and successful term, will my right hon. Friend congratulate the teachers, the parents and the students of the Newark Free School, a school designed to raise standards and performance in Newark, as is happening across the country? And would she agree with me? that to Conservatives, great teaching like this is not just about education, it is a daily battle for social justice, and we will never be distracted from that. Well, my honourable friend is absolutely right. First of all, I am very happy to join him in congratulating all those who were involved in setting up this much-needed free school. And uh, as uh, the Chair of Governors, I know my honourable friend will ensure that the school does provide young people in his constituency with an excellent education, despite, I understand, it, the school being po- opposed by the party opposite. But my honourable friend is absolutely right. This is not just a question of education, it is a question of social justice. A good quality education opens the door to the future for the lives of every one of those young people, and that is why it is so important that we ensure the quality of education is there to give pe- young people the best possible start in life. Lady Alexander. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Tonight, this House will hopefully have the chance to vote on my new clause 22 to the EU withdrawal bill, which would give Parliament the power at a future date to determine whether we leave the single market by coming out of the European Economic Area. It does not dictate how honourable members should then vote, but it does ensure proper democratic oversight. Should not it be our sovereign parliament and not the Prime Minister that decides our country's economic future? First of all, as I indicated earlier in response to my right honourable friend, the member for Chesham and Anmersham, this Parliament will have an opportunity to vote, will have a meaningful vote on the uh, withdrawal arrangements. But, but can I say to the honourable lady that she says that it should be Parliament that makes the decision about our uh, membership of the single market. Actually, this Parliament gave that decision about our membership of the European Union to the people of this country. People of this country who have voted to leave the European Union, and this government will deliver for the people of this country. Rishi Sunak. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, today thousands of profoundly disabled children are denied the opportunity to enjoy a day out with their families simply because there isn't an adequate changing room. The stories of parents at the Dale School in my constituency deeply moved me. So, could I ask the Prime Minister to strongly consider updating our building regulations to ensure broader provision and, in the meantime, to urge all relevant buildings to voluntarily install changing places to give these children the opportunities they deserve? Can I say to my honourable friend that I think he is right to uh, raise this very important issue, which might at at one glance seem quite a small issue, but actually is very important in the lives of those disabled uh, children, uh, to enable them to lead the life that they want to lead. And I agree with him that the provision of changing uh, changing places can make a real difference to disabled children, but also to their carers. I understand that the Department for Communities and Local Government it has been working to increase the number of facilities. I would certainly urge relevant building owners to consider installing changing places where they can, and I am sure that my right honourable friend, the Communities Secretary, will be happy to discuss this matter further with my honourable friend. Gareth Snell. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this week the Right Reverend Jeff Annis, the Bishop of Stafford, wrote to the Conservative-run Stoke-on-Trent City Council to plead with them not to cut a million pounds out of their homelessness support budget. 
Does the Prime Minister agree with the Bishop Jeff when he said that the measure of society can be found in the way that we treat our vulnerable people? And if so, will she join his calls for the City Council not to cut its homelessness support budget? And will she agree today to fund local government properly so that it can play its part in ending the scourge of homelessness? I would say to the Honourable Gentleman that, as I said in response to uh, the questions from the Leader of the Opposition, we do not want to see people without a roof over their head. That is why we are working in a number of ways to deal with this issue. It is why we are committed to halving rough sleeping by 2022 and eliminating it by 2027. Uh, as I also referred earlier, a number of announcements have been made in the Budget, and we are now dedicating over £1 billion to 2020 to tackling homelessness and rough sleeping. That is across a number of areas. That's a billion pounds to deal with the, this issue, to tackle what we agree is something that we don't want to see on our streets. Dr Caroline Johnson. Yeah. 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 It is now one year since I was sworn in as the MP for Sleaford and North. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> During the last year, the biggest issue in my post bag has been the provision of broadband to rural areas. The Government has invested heavily in this area, but many are still struggling with slow connections. Can my right hon. Friend reassure my constituents in Swayton, Blankneydale, Sudbrook and, el and, and elsewhere that we will do everything to ensure that everybody gets super-fast broadband and nobody is left behind? Can I uh, congratulate my honourable friend not only on her election a year ago yesterday, as uh, I believe it, but also on her re-election earlier this uh, this year, and on her year in this uh, in this house. She's raised an issue that is a matter of concern to many rural areas across the country, uh, and we do remain committed to universal broadband coverage of at least 10 megabits so that no home or business is left behind. Superfast broadband is now available to over 90% of premises in Lincolnshire, which is up from 26% in 2011, and we've committed over £1 billion for next generation digital infrastructure. But I can assure my honourable friend that we have not forgotten any community across the United United Kingdom, we recognise the importance of broadband to communities and we are working to ensure that we deliver further uh, so that people can have the services that they need. Alex Norris. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 2016, the then Home Secretary launched the Ending Violence Against Women and Girls strategy, which emphasised the need for a national network of domestic violence refuges. In 2017, Women's Aid say that the Government's proposals for short term supported housing threatens this network. In 2018, will that then Home Secretary, the now Prime Minister, show personal leadership, support women's aid and step in to save our refuges? I say to the Honourable Gentleman that I recognise the importance of, of dealing with the issue of domestic violence. When I was Home Secretary, we ring-fenced funding to uh, support the victims of domestic violence. We have continued to ring-fence that funding. We have also made a number of steps. We will be introducing a new domestic violence uh, law. We have introduced the coercive co law, uh, in a Criminal Act of Coercive Control. We have introduced a whole variety of changes that have improved the support for people with, uh, suffering from domestic violence. We are proposing a new funding model in relation to the provision of, uh, of housing and homes for people who have suffered from domestic violence. And there's a very good reason for wanting to see a change, which is to make this more responsive to the needs of the, uh, of the individuals at a time of crisis in their lives, to make the system work better. Because at the moment, the funding isn't responsive enough to their needs in local areas. They have to worry about meeting housing costs themselves at this time of crisis, uh, and access relies on welfare claims and eligibility. So we're proposing a new model that frees those women from worrying about me meeting the housing costs themselves, and the overall amount of funding available will remain the same. Dr. Sarah Wollaston. Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister join me in thanking all the wonderful staff from across the European Union who are working in our NHS and social care? And will she give them her personal, unequivocal assurance that they and their families will have the right to remain after Britain leaves the European yeah. Union? Yeah. Well, I'm, first of all, I'm very happy to join my honourable friend in thanking all those who work in our NHS and social care sector, including those from the, uh, across the European Union. They do do incredible work, and it's absolutely right. We 
recognise the contribution that EU nationals are making in this sector, but also across our economy and our society. Uh, that's why we want people to be able to stay, and we want families to be able to stay together. And that's why I'm very pleased that the uh, arrangements that we have and um, were published in the joint progress report between the United Kingdom and the European Union last Friday uh, show very clearly on citizens' rights that where people have made that life choice to be here in the United Kingdom, we will support them and enable them to carry on living their lives as before. Flint. In her answers so far, the Prime Minister has shown she hasn't got a clue about the concerns yeah, of small towns. Yeah, 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 yeah. Today and on the 14th of June, she said that no one and no community will be left behind. But the Doncaster market towns of Thorn and Bawtry have just been told that their NatWest branches are to close. That's two more on top of a record-breaking 700 bank branch closures this year. And that's despite the big four banks delivering £13.5 billion half-year profits. Disgraceful. Will the Prime Minister admit that the government's access to banking protocol has failed to keep yeah. a single branch open? Yeah, yeah. And will she restore the bank levy and use some of it to stop communities losing their last bank branch? Yeah. Well, can I say to the Right Honourable Lady, first of all, I responded to the uh, leader of the Scottish Nationalist Party earlier in relation to RBS closures, which I think is what uh, the Honourable Lady is referring to. But I think also she and others need to accept that actually people's behaviour in relation to banking branches, bank branches has changed over the years and there is less demand, but we have the access to banking standard in place. But she referred to the bank levy. Let's be very clear, there is a bank levy, there is also a corporation tax surcharge for banks, and this government is raising more money from the banks than the Labour government ever did. Peter Aldous! Much, Mr. Speaker, would my honourable, right honourable friend, join me in congratulating the UK's community foundations, who have just reached the notable milestone of distributing one billion pounds to local communities across the country? Would she agree that community foundations are a perfect example of her shared society, <clears throat> and that funds from dormant assets, once available, should be provided to them to continue their very important work? Well, I, I'm very happy to join my honourable friend in congratulating community foundations across the UK. I was uh, very pleased to be able to have a meeting with the Chief Executive of the Berkshire Community Foundation just uh, a couple of weeks ago to hear the excellent work they're undertaking in Berkshire. And I know from what my honourable friend has said that across communities across the country, these are an important contributor to uh, the shared, uh, an example of the shared society, as he says. And I understand Dormant Accounts Scheme has already distributed over 362 million for the benefit of good causes, and there's been a report on possibly expanding the scheme, which would have the potential to significantly build on the success of the current scheme. And the DCMS will be looking at this and will respond in due course. Mr. Barry Sherman. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, can I remind the Prime Minister of June 2nd, 1997, when I heard her make a very competent maiden speech, in which she stressed the importance of vocational and practical education for so many young people in our country? Is she aware there is now a crisis, a crisis for apprenticeships, a 62% fall in apprenticeship starts, many independent, excellent trainers going out of business, and FE colleges in dire, dire financial straits. Will she break a few heads, crack a few eggs, and get this sorted? Yeah. We see a growing number of uh, young people going into apprenticeships. We're introducing the T-levels. We're putting £500 million into technical education to ensure that, for the first time, this country has first-class technical education. I called for it in 1997. In 2017, I'm delivering. Yeah. Mr. Eddie Hughes! Mr Speaker, as an enthusiastic member of the Women and Equalities Committee, I, I aim to be a strong champion for the equality of women and I aspire to the title of Honorary Sister, as bestowed on you, Mr Speaker, by the Honourable Member for Camberwell and Peckham. So will the Prime Minister join me in congratulating Ruth Cook on her recent appointment as Chief Executive Clarion Group, the largest housing association in the country, proving that exceptional women can get the top job in housing and politics? Yeah. Uh, very happy
happy to agree with my honourable friend and to congratulate Ruth Kopp on her appointment for the Clarion Group. This does show that women can take on those very senior jobs. I have to say to my honourable friend that he is aspiring to uh, an accolade that I don't think the Right Honourable Member for Camberwell and Peckham has ever given to me, uh, despite... (laughs) Despite the fact of being only the only the second women prime, female prime minister in this country, and one day maybe the Labour sisterhood will manage to get a female leader of the Labour Party. Stephen Timms. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Assessing the impact of leaving the European Union on the different sectors of the UK economy is surely basic spade work for the negotiations. And yet the Brexit Secretary told the Select Committee last week that none of it has been done. Why not? No, uh, it isn't the case that no work has been done in looking at the... As the Right Honourable Gentleman knows from the over 800 pages of sectoral analysis that have been published... Uh, Mr Nicholas Bowles! Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has made clear that Brexit means Brexit. When it comes to the closure of Grantham a and now that the Trust believes that it has recruited enough doctors, does she agree with me that temporary means temporary? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What can I say? I know my honourable friend has been a, a strong champion of his constituents on this matter. He's been campaigning tirelessly in relation to it. I know that he will agree with me that the first priority must be to ensure patient safety, uh, and uh, that's why a report was commissioned by NHS Improvement. I, I understand NHS Improvement will, are continuing to work very closely with the Trust, and I'm sure that my right honourable friend, the Health Secretary, would be happy to discuss the detail with my honourable friend. Stuart Malcolm MacDonald. Yeah. In the run-up to Christmas, several people will be taking on extra seasonal work to try and earn themselves some extra cash for this time of year. But many employers will be offering unpaid trial work, often where an actual job doesn't actually exist. And it's affecting tens of thousands of people up and down the UK. But I've got a bill coming to the House in March next year to end unpaid trial shifts. So will she ensure this is the last Christmas of this exploitation and give government backing for it. Say yeah. so, the honourable gentleman, it is he knows. Of course, we already have uh, a legal position in this country in relation to the payment of the national minimum wage uh, and uh, uh, ensuring that people are paid for the work that they do. John Lamont. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, given that the SNP Scottish Government has an extra two billion pounds to play with, thanks to this Conservative government's yeah. budget. Yeah. Will the Prime Minister join me in calling on the First Minister of Scotland to rule out the higher taxes for hard-working Scots? Well, I I have to say to uh, my honourable friend, I think this is a very real test of the First Minister and the SNP Government in Scotland as to whether they are willing to recognise. I mean, last week, I seem to recall, we had some, or in in previous weeks, we've had some rather strange claims being made by the Scottish Nationalists here in this House about the impact of decisions taken at UK level on Scotland. But my honourable friend is absolutely right. Two billion pounds extra going into Scotland. But let's watch very carefully at how the SNP Government choose to spend that money. Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week I tabled a written question to the Chancellor asking for the evidence behind his extraordinary claim to the Treasury Select Committee that disabled workers are responsible for the UK's productivity problems. Last night I received his written answer. Unsurprisingly, there is no such evidence for that claim. So, disgracefully, since he so far declined to express any regret, will the Prime Minister take back control and order the Chancellor to withdraw his remark and apologise for inaccurate and offensive comments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I say to the honourable lady that actually the Chancellor did not express the views that she has uh, claimed that he was expressing. This is a government that values the contribution that disabled make, people make to our society and to our economy in the workplace. This is a government that is actually working to ensure that we can see more disabled people getting into the workplace. We've had some success, there's more to do, but we will continue to work to ensure that those disabled people who want to work are able to do so. Mims Davis. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recently sponsored an event in this place for the UN, the Draw the Line campaign, which has helped 6,000 women and girls worldwide to have a better life. But one in four women in the UK and 70% of girls around the world will expect to see physical or sexual violence in their life. Can this Prime Minister confirm this government will continue to lead the world on tackling trafficking, uh, trafficking rather, and exploitation? Well, I'm happy. I'm happy to confirm that to my honourable friend, and she raises, once again, raises a very important issue. It is, of course, this government that introduced the Modern Slavery Act. It's this government that is continue to, continuing to work, not only to uh, de- increase our ability to deal with the perpetrators of these crimes, but also to provide support to the victims. I want a, a world in which women and girls have the confidence to be able to be what they want to be and know they won't be subject to exploitation, to violence, to trafficking, to slavery. Of course, slavery applies to men as well, but I think our commitment as a government to ending violence and exploitation of women and girls is absolute. In Fletcher. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week it was announced that my wonderful city of Coventry had been successful in its bid to become UK City of Culture 2021, and we are bursting with pride. Will the Prime Minister join me in congratulating everyone who was instrumental in this great achievement and wish Coventry success, prosperity, hope and some fun in the next few years up to two 2021 and beyond. Can I say to the Honourable Lady that I will join her in congratulating Coventry on being selected as City of Culture, as she will be aware from exchanges that have taken place in this House at PMQs, there will be a number of Honourable Members of this House who are disappointed because their cities have not uh, achieved that particular status, but I am very happy to congratulate all those who were involved in putting the bid together and ensuring that Coventry is that City of Culture, including the Mayor for the West Midlands, Andy Street. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister and I have many things in common, including, if I may say, being proud of being called bloody difficult women. (laughs) My right honourable and learned friend, the member for Beaconsfield, is not in that category for many, many reasons. He is a, obviously, a man. He's a respected, seasoned parliamentarian and, like many on these benches, has been for many decades loyal to his party. Nobody wants to be disloyal or to bring about more disunity. The Prime Minister says she wants a meaningful vote on Brexit before we leave the European Union. Even at this last moment, would she be so good as to accept the Right Honourable and Learned Gentleman's Amendment 7 in the spirit of unity for everybody here and in the country. My, my, my Right Honourable Friend makes an important point about the concerns that people have had in this House about having a meaningful vote uh, on this particular issue before we complete the deal. As I set out in the earlier answer I gave to my Right Honourable Friend, the Member for Chesham and Amersham, that is what we will have. We will ensure that there is a meaningful vote on this, uh, in this House. <laughs> There will then, of course, be an opportunity for Parliament to look at the Withdrawal Agreement and Implementation Bill. uh, The the fact that there will be that meaningful vote has been set out and confirmed by my right honourable friend, the Brexit Secretary, in a written ministerial statement today. Um, We were very clear that we won't commence any statutory instruments until that meaningful vote has taken place. But as currently drafted, what the amendment says is that we shouldn't make any of those, put any of those arrangements, any of those statutory instruments into place until the withdrawal agreement and implementation bill has reached the statute book. That could be at a very late stage in the proceedings, which could mean that we are not able to have the orderly and smooth exit from the European Union that we wish to have. Jack Dreamy. Oh, you're on. You, you, oh, I say to the honourable gentleman who is trying to overcome his natural reticence. <laughs> I know he's a shy fellow, but I'm trying to encourage him. Mr. Dreamy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, not one penny for bu- to fit sprinklers to Birmingham's 213 tower blocks from government. Now the city suffering the biggest cuts in local government history 
is to suffer a further £100 million unfair funding cut. Shame. Shame. Yet Maidenhead is the constituency the least hard hit of any in Britain. Ah. How can the Prime Minister begin to justify one law for her own constituency and another law for the great city of Birmingham? Yeah. Yeah. I say to the right honourable gentleman that, of course, the local government settlement has yet to come before this, uh, before this House, uh, and we have been very clear in relation to fire safety arrangements and any action that needs to be taken by local authorities that they should discuss this with the Department of Communities and Local Government. We will ensure that uh, it is possible for the necessary safety work to be undertaken. James Gray. Speaker, 2017 marks the 100th anniversary of the foundation of the Women's Royal Naval Service, an event which will be celebrated in your house immediately after PMQs by a, a, in reception. Will the Prime Minister join with me in, in, in marking the outstanding service of women over 100 years in the Royal Navy, but also the Royal, Royal Air Force and Army? And will she particularly join me in welcoming the fact that women are no longer consigned to duties ashore, but they can now take part in every aspect of service? to agree with uh, my honourable friend. I think we should be, it is right that we're marking the centenary for the uh, Women's Royal Naval Service, uh, but also recognising the contribution that women have made across our armed forces, and I think it is important that they are now able to contribute across all uh, aspects of uh, work in the armed services, and are no longer restricted, as used to be the case in the Navy, to uh, jobs on shore. I think this is an important step forward. It strengthens our armed forces, and I congratulate all women in our armed forces. Thank you. Order!